We trust in your word and we trust in your power. Give all the glory in this place. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want you to find eight or ten people just to wait and say, Welcome. Find. the same spirit of worship, I want you to grab the best that you can give to the Lord. Grab the best that you can give to the Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you did last year, for what you did last month, for what you did last week, for what you did yesterday. The seed in my hand is in expectation of what you're about to do. Good measure, praise down, shaken together, and running over shall men bring unto my life. And every source of income will never run dry. If you believe it, quickly come and give to the Lord.
Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many expecting something from the Lord? How many expecting a touch from the Lord? Are you ready for what God has for you in this place? Somebody scream for Jesus. Scream for Jesus. Praise the Lord. I will just make a few announcements. First, I want to greet everybody that has come for the first time. Uh, we welcome you in the house of God. I pray that God may minister to you. God may meet you at the point of your needs today. Amen. And that when you leave this place, you'll be better than the way you came in. Emotionally, spiritually, and financially in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So we welcome you. Don't feel at home. Be at home. Because feelings, they come and they go. But be at home. This is your home. This is the house of God. This is your house. This is our house. Amen. And amen. Um, I want to greet our elders in the house. Hallelujah. Let's clap hands for our elders in the house. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to greet our pastors, Pastor Grace, Pastor Denae, Pastor Prince, Reverend Kana, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Our ministers in the house, let's step in for ministers. I want to also acknowledge Brother Thierry for an awesome time of prayer. Let's clap hands. Amen. Let's clap hands for our international worship team. Hallelujah. And I want us to welcome Mama in the house. Amen. Let's clap hands for Mama's hand. I think Pastor Sarah is in the house and I just can't see, it's a bit dark, I can't see most of you, but I think she's here. I just remembered, amen, we welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Announcement, it will be announced again, uh, ladies to stay behind. Um, Mama wants to say something, so stay behind. And the second announcement, um, early morning of Monday, we lost one of our own. Amen. Most of you are already aware of that. Um, Tendo. Um, we lost one of our own, so we've been having services, and God has been awesome in this time of sorrow, in this time of pain, but we have learned how to turn this into a time of celebration and remembering her as who she became and that she deserves a seat in the place in heaven. Amen. So this Tuesday is going to be a send-off that is going to happen in this church. Amen. So to those that are available, make sure you make time and you are here from the 10 a.m. to the 3 to 1 o'clock. 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock. Make sure you don't miss our send off for one of our own amen and it's going to be an awesome time not a crying moment but a celebrating moment amen we'll be celebrating her as we send her off in an awesome way hallelujah let's clap hands for what the lord <laughs> Praise the name of the living God. Um, um, I just want to acknowledge those who were going every day to the place and everybody who supported and who ministered. Let's clap hands for our empowerment team. They really pulled off and they really showed up and they made us proud amen and amen when this is what we call family 
we must be one. When one of us is not well, we are all not well. When one of us is celebrating, we are all celebrating. And yesterday, one of us was celebrating again. Amen. Come. Come. Alpha and Miriam. Hallelujah. Stand up. Come. You can come in front. Let them see how beautiful you are looking. Look at that. Look how awesome they are looking. Come. Look at that. Hallelujah. Look at the people. Look at the people. Uh, yesterday. All right. All right. All right. Amen. the awesome thing Miriam is my sister so yesterday I was part of the charging team for the Lobola negotiating the price Amen and I met Alpha when I was going in the house then he reminded me please don't make it hard for me because we had talked before but because they are all God fearing and the family they were marrying into a God-fearing. I must say, I've never seen a peaceful event like yesterday. And we want to celebrate what God has joined. Let no man put asunder. This is what the Lord has done. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now... As a church, I want you to stretch hands towards them. And we are going to pray. You can look at me and let me pray with you. Father, we thank you for this blessed union. We back them up with our prayers. Spiritually, Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do. And we thank you for the beginning of a new chapter. Heavenly Father, let angels guard them jealously. Whoever want to be in between them, Father, let angels fight their battle. Lord, no demon in hell will be able to come in between them. We thank you for angelic covering. We thank you because this will be a marriage made in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on. Clap your hands. Once again, celebrate them in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you are single, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm next. <laughs> sure, I'm next. Amen. Praise the name of the living God. Um, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19. If I forgot something, I'll remember and then I'll announce it. But Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. And once again, we are streaming live. So if you can, for a few seconds, just go and share and invite somebody to church. You never know who can get born again just by you sharing it on your platform and inviting people to be blessed this afternoon. I promise you, 
God is about to change the way you think today. Amen. Um, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Let's do King James Version today of all the scriptures because I was studying with King James Version, so I don't want to miss my point and my thought. Matthew 28, verse 19 to verse 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. And when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee. Now let's count. The first nation is the Hittites, the Gigashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites, and the Povertites, every ites that you can think of. He says, they are how many nations? Seven nations that are greater and mightier than thou. Go to verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Verse 3. Neither thou shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Okay, we we'll end there. Um, you read the whole chapter seven, you understand. Now, I want to talk about the pillar of religion. The pillar of religion. We're going to talk about the pillar of religion. I will explain to you where I am getting my, my theme from. Amen. You may take your seats if you can. Amen. Only those that were standing can shout, I'm in charge. <laughs> You're already sitting. <laughs> Amen. Um, the book of Matthew chapter number 28 begins to, to teach us that our mandate and assignment from God is to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Notice he said your assignment is to make disciples of nations. Your assignment is to make disciples of nations. So the critical question that if you are wise and you are spiritual would ask is, how do I make disciple a nation? Amen. How do I disciple a nation? Now, I'm glad you asked that question. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 7, from verse number 1, if you read it up to verse number 6, God begins to show you that the territory that he is sending you is occupied. He tells you, go and disciple a nation. No, not a nation, nations. And then he begins to tell you that I am sending you, but the nations that I'm sending you is occupied. So I'm not just sending you in an empty territory. I'm sending you in a territory that is already occupied. And he goes on to explain to you that the people that are occupying the territory are greater than you. The people that are occupying the territory 
are stronger than you. So I don't want to lie to you by not telling you what to expect from this assignment that I'm giving you. It says, go and disciple a nation. But in the nation that I'm sending you, there are seven territorial spirits that are in control of the nation. And he begins to name them the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and he starts to name them the Canaanites, the Hevites. And all in all, there were seven. So he said, I'm sending you to a nation so that you can penetrate and occupy. But the nation that I'm sending you has seven territorial spirits that are controlling it. And your goal and your assignment is to penetrate and occupy it. Remember, Jesus comes and says, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt penetrates. Salt adds flavor. It says your duty as a child of God, as a disciple, is you are supposed to get into a territory, but the territory you must be aware that they are seven enemies. Now, the nation that we are sent on assignment may not have Jebusites, may not have Ammonites, may not have Canaanites, but they are also seven nations or systems that you and I, we are supposed to be aware of that as we are going on this assignment to occupy, we are supposed to deal with these seven nations. Amen. So now, these are seven nations. I'm going to give you the seven nations that we are going to deal with and I will explain to them only one today. Amen. The whole service, I'm going to explain only one. Now, the first system or the first nation that we ascend to occupy and take territory and claim it for the kingdom of God is the media. The media... Then the second one is the education sector. That means children of God or disciples are called to occupy the education sector and take over the education sector and claim the territory for the kingdom of God. Now you're getting that in this time of age that you are, we are living in, children are being taught what is not godly because the education sector has been taken away from the church. Then we have the government. The government is supposed to belong to children of God. We have the arts and entertainment. What you are supposed to, in, to enjoy on the TV is supposed to be for the kingdom of God. Then we have the business and economy. So we are getting people that are predicting or they are telling us where the economy is going and they are not even God-fearing. So somebody tells you we are crashing and we believe it because it's not us who is controlling. We are just living as somebody is controlling. Then that, please control the kids. Then we have family. Family is supposed to be run according to God. Are we together? Family is supposed to be run according to God. So we have the media, number one. We have the education, number two. We have the government, number three. We have the arts and entertainment, number four. We have business and economy, number five. We have family, number six. Then we have religion, number seven which makes up the seven nations or the seven systems that we are supposed to be discipling as disciples of God. Are we together so far? So when Jesus said, go ye therefore and disciple a nation, you are supposed to be aware that the nation you are called to disciple, there are seven strongholds that you are supposed to deal with. Amen. A child of God, when you wake up in the morning, you are fighting against the media. 
A child of God, when you wake up in the morning, you're fighting against what is on the entertainment sector. That's why if you decide, let me go on Instagram, as you are scrolling, then you see a woman with a bikini. Because no child of God is controlling it. Am I talking to real people in the church? I said, am I talking to real people in the church? You see, they are marketing a car. And you are seeing a car, you are loving the car. And then they put a naked woman marketing the car. Because nobody is controlling the arts and entertainment. Or controlling the media. So you get to know that as I'm going to disciple the nation, I am going to be fighting with seven strongholds, which is the government, the business economy, the media, the arts and entertainment, and I'm also going to deal with family. And the one I'm going to talk about is religion today. Oh, it's hard to talk about religion in a church. But I'm going to talk about religion, and I believe each one of us is going to be delivered from the spirit of religion. I said, each one of us, everyone that is watching me and everybody in this house, God is going to deliver you from the spirit of religion. Say, I receive it. Say, I receive it. Now, we live in the most possibly spiritual time and yet the most godless time we are living in the most spiritual time but yet the most godless time you must never confuse spirituality and godliness <laughs> people don't understand what i'm saying just because somebody is talking about god doesn't mean they are coming from god so most of us, we think if something is spiritual, it means it's coming from God. Do you know that Satan talked about God, but he was not coming from God when he was talking to Eve? Because spirituality doesn't mean you are godly. So we are living in probably one of the most spiritual time, but yet it's the most ungodly time that we are living. There is less of God and more of spirituality. Now, what is religion? What is religion? Religion is a worshipping of a deity through a set of beliefs producing a distinction of a group. Religion is when you are worshipping a deity by setting a belief, some set of beliefs, and therefore producing a distinction of a group. So here we are, we are a religious group. Because we are worshipping a deity. And we have a set of beliefs which produced empowerment church. So empowerment church is a religion. So Christianity is a religion. But the problem begins when we become religious and not godly. That's what you're going to deal with this afternoon. Hallelujah. Jesus had a problem with the spirit of religion in the disciples. Let me show you a scripture. In Luke chapter 9 verse 53. Jesus is dealing with the disciples and is dealing with this spirit of religion. And they did not receive him because his first Jesus sent his disciples to get supply in Jerusalem. I want you to watch this. And when they send, when he sent his disciples to get supplies in Jerusalem, what happens? They did not receive because his face was as though he would not go to Jerusalem. Go down. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, Will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? The spirit of religion. Can I show you the spirit of religion? Now, Jesus sends them on an assignment to do something. But the people did not accept what they were saying. 
and when they go back with the with with information to jesus they said to him these people are not accepting us let us go down fire like elijah and consume them i have a question and the question is these guys never said jesus call down fire like elijah and consume them they say jesus let us call down fire like elijah that means james and john knew how to call down fire like elijah i don't know if it's 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 a class that is deep enough to understand what i'm about to say they say let me and john call down fire like Elijah did. I can do what Elijah did. How did they know if Jesus did not teach them? Because the same chapter in verse 28, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John in the mountain of transfiguration. And what happened on the mountain of transfiguration? They met Moses and Elijah. So they had an encounter with Moses and Elijah in the mountain of transfiguration. And when they came from the mountain, they see the disciples struggling to cast out a demon. And Jesus said, you of little faith. And then in verse 53, they are sent to get supplies. And they come and they see people that did not believe in what they are saying. And they tell Jesus, let's call down fire and consume these people. The spirit of religion is a spirit that claims exclusivity. That if people don't believe in what I am believing, they must die. The spirit of religion is a spirit that claims what we do in empowerment church is everything that God wants people to do. And if people don't worship the way that we worship in empowerment church, they deserve to die with the fire of Elijah. I'm getting ready to deliver somebody. The spirit of religion claims exclusivity that the way we worship is the best way to worship. And do you know what Jesus said to the disciples? Go down to verse 54. He says, go down. He says, what manner of spirit you are of. I don't recognize this spirit. This is not my spirit that you're operating under. What kind of spirit are you speaking of? He rebuked them. Just because somebody doesn't agree with your set of beliefs doesn't mean they need to die. So we are living in a time, I told you the most spiritual and yet godless time, where people say, if you don't pray the way we pray, you are not of God. If you don't fast the way we fast, you are not of God. If people in our church, our ladies are wearing trousers, it's not from God. Because you want to claim exclusivity in the way that people should pray. And the problem is, when you have a personal encounter with God, it must never become a system that you establish in church. It's your own personal encounter. It must never become doctrine. So when you were having a time with God and in a time of prayer and then God told you, I don't want you to wear trousers. Don't come and make it a doctrine. So for you, it's correct because God showed you, but don't make it a doctrine. And go around everybody, they are Jezebel because they are wearing trousers. It's, it's like calling down fire and saying, consume them because they are doing it. It's a spirit of religion. Am I helping somebody in this place? He says, what manner of spirit are you guys operating? This is not my spirit. I don't recognize this spirit at all. This spirit must be coming from a different source. Hallelujah. Dr. Mouse Monroe said something. He said, a fool is a trapped wise man. Don't kill him when he's still a fool. Because in every doubter there is a believer. Give him time. Because when you kill him, you can't save him. You can't save what you have, what you have already killed. 
So he gives an example. What's more better, to kill a terrorist or to get a terrorist to be born again? To get a terrorist to be born again. Because in every doubter, there is a believer. In every fool, there is a trapped wise man. So give him time to change. Teach him before you kill him because you can never change what you've already killed. So when you see people that are doing things, instead of judging them, make sure you make them know what is the right way to go. And stop calling down fire on everybody who disagrees against you. It's a religious spirit. Just because I don't believe what you're believing, stop calling fire. Fire will judge you. And that's the problem, Pastor Sarah, we're having in this generation. If you don't pray according to the encounter that I had with God in 1995, then you are doing it the wrong way. I'm calling fire to consume every false prophet. And yet your encounter is always personal. And you can't make your personal encounter a doctrine. Because God is bigger than what he told you. <laughs> God is bigger than what you know. And all you know is not all that needs to be known. There is so much to know that you don't know. And if you think you know everything that you are knowing, you are exposing your ignorance because there is so much that you don't know. Hallelujah. Ah, the spirit of religion. Now, let me give you an example, uh, some ideas of what is religion and what is the kingdom. Is that okay? Now, a person that is a religious spirit, number one, he prepares men to leave the earth. Have you seen people who always talk about going to heaven, going to heaven, going to heaven, going to heaven? They are preparing people to leave the earth. But you know the doctrine of the kingdom of God doesn't teach on leaving the earth to heaven. It talks about preparing heaven to invade earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you know the message of Jesus was the kingdom of God is at hand? He talked about heaven coming on earth more than people are talking about that. People are talking about going to heaven more than they're talking about heaven coming on earth. So a religious spirit focuses on leaving the earth while the kingdom focuses on invading the earth. Religion focuses on heaven and the kingdom focuses on the earth. Religion focuses on escaping the earth while the kingdom focuses on invading the earth. The kingdom focuses on bringing heaven on earth while religion focuses on bringing earth to heaven. So many of us when we preach, we are talking about when you go to heaven. And Jesus said, no, that's not my message. My message is heaven must come on earth. Somebody shout, I understand. Shout, I understand. Isaiah 28 verse 10. This was only the milk. Now I'm about to give you bones. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? Isaiah 28 verse 10. We'll see then. Isaiah 28 verse 10, King James Version, if you have an NIV, look at the screen. Because my message is going to be um, helped by the King James Version. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Precept must be upon precept, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm trying to shut down. Siri is confusing me now. Right. She's answering everything I'm saying knows precept upon precept line upon line now a precept is the most 
important thing. Are you sure you're ready? I said, are you sure you're ready? Now, a precept is a grammatical construct, which is a coming in of two words. The prefix is pre. Now you're separating pre and sept. The word pre means before. I'm, I promise you're going to be the smartest person when you go back to work on Monday. It's a grammatical construct. It's a coming in of two words. That's what it means. The pre simply means before. And the sept means a thought. So precept means a thought before a thought in the thought process. Or an idea before the idea. So when you say a precept, you are saying a thought before a thought. That's what we call a precept. Now, a precept produces, Pastor Prince, what we call a concept. Now, a concept, again, is a grammatical construct of two words, con and sept. Con simply means one or when, when something comes together. And sept means a thought, right? So when you say a concept, it means when a thought comes together. I promise you're going to be the most smartest person at work. So a precept, which is a thought before a thought, produces a concept, which means when a thought becomes one, or when it is conceived to become a picture. So when a thought is conceived to become a picture, it becomes a concept. And a concept becomes or produces what we call an ideology. Now, an ideology simply means a believed thought. It's a thought that you now believe in. So when you believe in a thought, it becomes an idea. Oh my God. Lord, help me right here. So we have a precept, which is a thought before a thought, then which produces a concept, which is a, a, a thought becoming one, coming together. And when that concept, it produces an ideology, which becomes a believed thought. So it's something that I now believe. Right. It's now an ideology. Now, do you know what an ideology produces? A philosophy. Now, what is a philosophy? A philosophy is a coming in of two words, a grammatical construct, philo and sophie. Philo means to love. Sophie means to think. So philosophy simply means to love the way you think. <sighs> Jesus, help me. Are you guys understanding this? Are you sure? So, when you say a philosophy, what do you mean? It means, when you say somebody has a philosophy, what does it mean? It means they love the way they think. They love the way they think. So, when you love the way you think, which is an idea that has been believed, produces a philosophy, which is the way you love the thing that comes in your mind, it produces a belief system. This is where I'm going to help many people. You produce what we call a belief system. A belief system is a system that filters everything that comes to you. A belief system is a system that feeds everything that comes in your life. So if somebody says something to you, it goes through your belief system and it feeds through your belief system. And it determines whatever you do. Amen. Amen. Now, your belief system or your philosophy affects your theology. Theology simply means the study of God. So, how you understand God is affected by how you think. Your philosophy is more important than your theology because your philosophy is a foundation, your theology is a conclusion. So, how people understand God is affected by how they think in their head. 
It's affected by their belief system, how they filter everything that comes in your life. Let me make you understand. Can I make you understand? So if your belief system is materialistic, you, you are material, that's your belief system. You, you are material, you love material things. If somebody comes to you and says, I love you, you your, your belief system says, what are you giving? <laughs> what, what are you giving me? Because your belief system is material. All you're thinking is, what are they giving me? And if you have gone through abuse in your life, it shapes up your belief system. So when somebody say, I love you, you say they are taking advantage of me. <laughs> I may open somebody in this place. Why? Because your belief system is affecting everything in your life. Because it feeds everything is fed by your belief system. So the way you see God is affected by your belief system, your ideas. So whether what you know is true or false is dependent on the source of your ideas. So the question becomes, what is the source of your ideas? Because your ideas are what is affecting your belief system. So whether it's true or not, it's also depending on who is giving you your ideas? So they come to Jesus in John chapter 8. Let me make you understand now. John chapter 8, verse 23. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I say to you that you die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you die in your sins. And they say to him, who are you? Jesus just gave him his ideology. And they asked his identity. And Jesus answered and said, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. So Jesus says, you guys are struggling to understand my ideology. But I want to assure you my ideology is true because of he who sends me. So whether your ideology is true or false or your belief system is true or false is dependent on your source that you are feeding from. And there are many things that can affect your ideology or your belief system. And the seven pillars that I gave you can affect the way you think. The media can affect the way you think. It can affect your belief system. What you see every day can end up affecting what you think. Amen. Your family can affect the way you think because your family can be a source of your ideas. Your community can be a source of your ideas. The government can be a source of your ideas. And so, so now here's the thing. Zimbabwe declared that there is a drought. It's the government. They declared there is a drought. So it affects your ideas. So even the way you, you, you want to start business, you are starting away of that idea. Am I talking to people in this place? Am I talking to somebody in this place? So when the, when the business and the economy comes and they say, we are hitting a credit crisis or the rand is going down. That idea can affect you starting a business. Because it's a source. So whether your belief system is true or false is dependent on your source. Who is your source? And Jesus said, what I tell you is true because my source is God. My source is who? God. So I can... Depend or I can die for what I'm saying you. Because whatever I'm saying is coming from God. Go to verse 36 and 38, Sam. It says, therefore, same chapter. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendant, but you seek to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen my father. And you do what you're seeing with your father. He says, 
I speak what I see my father. The word father means source. Says the way I speak is based on the source that I get my information. And the way you speak is based on your source because you speak what you see your father doing. Are you hearing what I'm saying, children of God? So your belief system is affected by your source. Whether it's true or false is based on what's your source. Turn to neighbor and say, what's your source? What's your source of your information? So my question becomes, when you say I am sick, what's the source of your information? When you say I am broke, what's the source of your information? When you say I am depressed, what's the source of your information? Because whether what you are saying is true and false is dependent on who is the source of your information. Who is your father? What's your source? So if somebody says to you, I'm feeling tired, what's your source? Hallelujah. Somebody should I hear you? Should I hear you? Go to verse number verse number 38. Uh, that's where we are reading, right? Uh, go to verse number 44. Can I go a little bit deeper? It says, you are of your father, the devil. And the last of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. That means anything that is false, the source is Satan. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. So every time you speak a lie, you are exposing who is your source. Yeah. Hallelujah. You are exposing who is your source. And your, your belief system is messed up because of your source. Hallelujah. And when your belief system, which is the foundation, is messed up, your theology will be messed up also. Hallelujah. Says the words that I speak to you, they are true because they are coming from my father who is true. And you know, John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was... Now the word that we are using here from the Greek is called logos. So which means Jesus was the logos of God. And the word logos simply means an expressed idea. Hallelujah. So if I come to you and say, show me your ideas in your brain, you can't show me because ideas are invisible. Ideas are what? Silent. But when you speak them out, you manifest what you are thinking. So if you want to know what I'm thinking, wait for me to speak. Because the moment I speak, I express my ideas. So the question or the idea is, if you want to know what God is thinking, listen to Jesus. Because Jesus is the expressed idea of God. He's the Logos. So when God wanted to show the earth what he was thinking, he gave Jesus. Because Jesus expresses the ideas that God had. He says, I speak what I see my father doing. I express the ideas of my father. So when I come to you and say you are prosperous, I am expressing what God is thinking. When I say you are healed, I am expressing what God is thinking. Now the thing is, your philosophy gives birth to an attitude. And if you have a stinking attitude, you have a bad philosophy. Hallelujah. Many people that have a stinking attitude have a bad philosophy. Because their thinking system, their way of thinking is messed up. And because it's messed up, it affects their attitude. You have a stinking attitude towards people because your belief system and your philosophy is messed up. Hallelujah. So the problem becomes when you shut down and you close the door of your belief system. And you say... I don't want to listen to anybody else. You stop growing. You stop growing and you get stuck. And when you stop growing and you get stuck, it's a foundation of tradition. And uh, the book of Mark chapter 7 says, you have made the word of God of no effect because of your tradition. And this is where the problem begins. When we have a foundation of tradition, 
whereby we have stopped growing. Tradition simply means a system that is shut down, that has stopped growing. You don't want anybody to tell you anything. You have shut down your belief system. You, you believe what you know is what needs to be known. You believe everything that you have heard and you have listened to is all that needs to be known. Now you become a spiritual, a religious person. Nobody tells you anything because you have shut down your belief system. You don't want to learn anymore. You have put a foundation of tradition. It's a shut down system that doesn't want to learn anymore. That doesn't want new ideas. I don't want to hear that. That's not from God. I know what I heard God 2,000 years ago. I know what I heard God 10 years ago. Whatever you're saying, I can listen to it. I believe what I believe. You have stopped growing. Therefore, you are operating with tradition. And the Bible says you have made the word of God of no effect. So whatever is preached today, you won't listen because your belief system is shut down. What you know is what you know and that's all you need to know. And you have shut down everything and you don't listen when people tell you this is what god is saying you need to do this you need to be you don't listen because you're saying ah what i know is what i know and the problem when a belief system is shut down it leads to tradition and the word tradition is the same word for stronghold you you now have a stronghold in the mind and it's harder. I mean, he, listen to me. It's hard to penetrate on a stronghold. Right now, since I started, I have been fighting to penetrate in stronghold in here. There is a lot of strongholds. So, ah, what is he saying? It's not, it's not the same gospel that I was hearing when I was growing up. What is he saying? There's a stronghold that has been shut down, that is refusing to let in new ideas. So you have been stuck where you are. Do you know the way you dress is because of a belief system? Do you know where you are is because of a belief system? Your belief system is what filters everything that happens in your life. So if you are not happy with where you are, it means you need to change your belief system. Because you can never become beyond your belief system. Holy Ghost, help your people right here. You can never become. So what makes me dress the way I am dressed right now is my belief system. Hallelujah. What makes Albert to dress the way he's dressed is his belief system. And our belief system is shaped because of our culture, because of the families we grew up with, because of the doctrine that we have taught religion. Because of the government that we come from. Because of the media, what we see on TV. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So some of you, you dress because you saw somebody you like on, on, on Umvango, if he's still there, I don't know. You saw someone you like and it affected the way you dress. It affected, it brought ideas on the way you dress, your belief system. So, your, your way, where you are right now, is a product of your belief system. And some of you, we are dealing with strong words. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 12, he says, how can you enter into a strong man's house unless you bind the strong man? You cannot plunder his goods. So what we need to do is, we need to come and we need to bind the strong man in your mind so that some of you gets delivered right now. Because there is a strong man that refuses to know better. If I come and I tell you your success is connected to your giving, you say, ah, they've started now, they want to take money. Are you hearing what I'm saying, Church of God? It's what, do you think, do you think that's just coming from nowhere? Do you think you are just saying it because it came to your mind? No. Somebody put those ideas in you. And when they put those ideas in you, it was a, a precept 
and and the more you you start believing in it and it came together it became a concept until you believed in that thought it becomes an ideology and an ideology gave birth to a philosophy now you have a stinking attitude because your belief system is wrong hallelujah and now the way you look at god the way you deal with the things of god is messed up you 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 walk around and say god does not love me because things are not well for me it's because somebody told you the way you you are experiencing is is manifesting the way god loves you you think your lifestyle is what defines whether god loves you or not so you're walking around your theology is messed up because you're saying if god loved me why am i suffering remember your philosophy now your belief system that feeds everything is telling you that if you are suffering god does not love you now it affects your understanding of god so you become religious and now it becomes a strong word because you don't want to listen to anybody who comes to you and say god loves you say so, ah i'm tired of hearing that i've been hearing that all my life amen if god loves me why did he take my mother if god loves me why did he take my father you are connecting your your losses and depicting them they manifest whether god loves you or not your philosophy is wrong and it has affected your theology and god is saying the strong man of your life in your mind has to be bind and you must never stop growing you must never shut down the door of learning new ideas hallelujah so whatever i am teaching you right now you have to make sure that the belief system that is going to be filtered in produces results hallelujah your belief system must never treat this as a virus and throws it into the bin. That's there are people like that. Their belief system treats everything that that is coming from God as a virus and throws it in the bin. But may God help you in the place. Stand up in the presence of God. Thank you Holy Spirit. We're going to pray tonight, today, this afternoon. And our prayer is very simple. Lord, fix my belief system. In Matthew 4 verse 17, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I told you last time that repent is not an attack on your spirit. It's an attack on your mind. When God comes and says repent, it means change the way you think, which is your belief system. The reason why you are where you are is because of your belief system. So repent. Change the way you think because the kingdom of God is at hand. So how you receive the kingdom of God can be affected if you don't change the way you think your belief system. Theology is a conclusion, but you can affect the conclusion if your foundation is wrong. If the way you think is wrong, which is your philosophy, it affects your theology of receiving the kingdom of God. You can be stuck in the doctrine of the first Adam and not the doctrine of the second man. Hallelujah. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Change the way you think. Because we are no longer under the Adamic nature. We are now under the second man. And the second man came from heaven. The first man came from earth. The second man came from heaven. And because he came from heaven, he is heavenly. Hallelujah. So now you, you, you have accepted a theology
because you have decided to change the way you think. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. There is a new dispensation that God is about to release in this era. But how people will receive it is going to be depicted by your belief system, the way you think. When somebody comes and tells you God loves you, how do you interpret that? How, do, how does your filtering system interpret that? Amen. When somebody comes to you and says, trust in God, how do you filter that? When somebody tells you that God knows everything that is going in your life, how do you filter that? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Change the way you think. Change your philosophy. I know it's a years of eating ideas from people that you trusted. Some, some ideas that you have, you got them from religious leaders that you were once affiliated with. Not saying they were bad. I'm not saying they were bad, but I'm saying that you need to know that God speaks based on the season that you are in. <laughs> and God speaks based on the season that that person is. And if you make a doctrine based on the season that they were in and not know that God has changed the season, you can be stuck in the past while others are moving in the future. Am I talking about, I'm talking to church right here. So the spirit of religion is a spirit that wants to stuck on what God said. Not what God is saying. God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, go and sacrifice your only son, Isaac. That was a rhema word from God. But then God appeared and says, Abraham, don't kill Isaac. I've made provision for a lamb. And if Abraham had no discernment to discern what God was saying, he was operating with the spirit of religion. Because the spirit of religion operates with what God said. So there was a time it was correct. But just because it was correct then doesn't mean it's correct now. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Now, this won't work in Africa, but in America, there are different states. And one state says abortion is a crime. And another says you have a freedom to do what you want to do with your body. Now, if you go to a state that says it's a crime with the mentality of the other state that says you are free to do what you want with your body, you will get arrested. Hallelujah. So just because something is true there, doesn't mean it's true everywhere. You must be willing to capture new ideas of what God and the Spirit of God is saying based on the season that you are in right now. Hallelujah. What is God saying to you right now? Don't shut down everything based on what you heard 10 years ago. Hallelujah. Apostle God told me 10 years ago, I'm going to do this. Don't want to step into others' people's shoes. I'm going to use do this. But the question becomes, what is he saying right now? Hallelujah. One season he can tell you, don't get married. I want you to focus on ministry. And then after two years he says, no, get married. I want you to get married. So you can't brush off what he's saying now based on what he said. What he said is the spirit of religion. So you are making the word of God of no effect because of your tradition. 
you have shut down God ideas because you are focusing on what he has said which is now tradition which is now religion hallelujah lift up your hands towards heaven repent for the kingdom of God is at hand this is my message to you today as we are dealing with the pillar of religion repent for the kingdom of God is at hand begin to pray wherever you are pray that the spirit of God helps you to change the way you think pray that the spirit of God helps you to change the way you think repent for the kingdom of God is at hand Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Jesus, you are exactly what you thought you are. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are both correct. Because you are what you thought you are. Your thoughts created you right now. Matthew chapter 5, Psalm 51, verse 10. The word heart in the Bible, and 99% of the time when the Bible uses the word heart, it's referring to a mind. Most of the time, 99%, when the Bible uses the word heart, it's referring to a mind. Do you know why it's difficult to change? your mind the reason why it's difficult to change your mind is because you need your mind to change your mind (laughs) so it's hard it's hard to change the way you think your mindset your set of mind because you're gonna need your mind to change your mind now, uh, verse 10 says, God create a clean heart for me. Uh, put King James Version. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. Something is wrong with Creating me a right spirit. Now the word spirit here, if you look at it, the S is a small S. Which means it's talking about your attitude. It says, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Which is talking about your attitude. So he's saying, creating me the right way of thinking. And renew my attitude because the way I think affects my attitude so he begins to pray and says Lord I pray that you give me a clean way of thinking oh God renew a right attitude within me that's your prayer today Lord, give me a clean thinking system. I need a a, a clean thinking system. I need to change the way I think. And when I change the way I think, Lord, I need you to renew a right attitude within me. Because I told you, your attitude is a result of your thinking system, your belief system. If you have a stinging attitude, that means your belief system is... Is wrong. So many of us we are fighting with the spirit of religion, and some of us don't even know we are dealing with the spirit of religion because we are thinking of it in too much extremes. Ha. Huh. But yet you are dealing with the spirit of religion every time you are believing in what God said 10 years ago, not what he's saying right now. You are dealing with the spirit of religion. Every time you you don't believe when God tells you, I'm about to prosper you, you think, ah, not for me. If I say God is about to give people million dollar breakthrough, you're looking at your neighbor because your belief system says there is no way. There is no way that it can be me. So you quickly brush it off. They say, God is about to give marriage in this house. You say, ah, not me. I have enjoyed life. I don't think I deserve that. Your belief system feeds everything 
So it affects even your response to what God is giving you. And when someone wants to bless you with love, you brush it off because you think you don't deserve it based on your past. Your past has shaved the way you think so much that right now in the future, God is saying, it's yours. You're saying, no, it cannot be for someone like me. You don't know where I'm coming from. I cannot deserve this. You don't know, Apostle, where I'm coming from. You don't know the things that I have to deal with. There is no way that a person like me can receive these things. And God is saying, repent. David teaches us, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I'm tired of the way I'm thinking. I'm tired of my thinking system. Lord, I'm tired of my belief system. Create in me a new belief system, oh God. I need to renew my attitude. I, I'm tired of the way I treat people wherever I go. I'm treating people, not because they are bad people, but I'm treating people bad because of where I am coming from. And some of you, you hate people that have no business to be hated because... You hate them not because they did something wrong to you. You hate them because somebody told you that they are bad people. And you never gave them a chance to prove that who they are. If you knew who they are, you probably be calling them besties right now. But you chose to listen to somebody who had a moment of error with them and they defined them based on an event. And now you are thinking this is an evil person and you never had time to know them. But because your belief system was fed with ideas, now you filter everything based on that filtering system and you say, no, I don't like this person. And if you ask, why don't you like them? You just say, I don't just like them. Say, Lord, give me a new thinking system say lord give me a clean thinking system give me a clean thinking system say heavenly father renew my attitude i want you to mean it in your heart because this is going to affect your theology, how you treat people. Some of us, we are not really good with treating people the right way. And this has affected how you attract things in your life because you don't know how to love people. Say, Lord, renew my attitude. Say it like you believe it. Say, Lord, renew my attitude. When you leave this place, you start loving even your mother-in-law. You start loving even everyone that stays in your streets. You want them to come to your church, but you don't love them. How can they come to your church? You know, I was talking to uh, the guys that are in the church, that we spend time in the church with. And I was saying, I was listening to one of them, the greatest men, uh, to ever grace the world, Mouse Monroe. And he says something profound. I never thought in my whole life, I never thought, Mama Sana, he said to me, the problem with the church is we talk about Jesus more than we talk about the kingdom of God. Let that thing sink in your head. And I said, what, where is this man going? He says, when, when South Africa is inviting people for tourism, they don't talk about Cyril Ramaphosa. They don't talk about Cyril Ramaphosa because nobody will come to South Africa for Table Mountain. So they invite people to South Africa by showing them how beautiful Table Mountain is. The history of Robin Island. And when they come to South Africa, then they meet Cyril Ramaphosa. So your problem is you are talking about Jesus more than you are talking about the kingdom of God. Look at that. Look at that, that stronghold mind saying he's heretic right now. But I'm not. 
Jesus didn't talk about himself, he talked about the kingdom of God. So it's the reason why people are not coming to church. I'm, I, I promise this is going to bless somebody. The reason why people are not coming to church is because we are talking about Jesus, not talking about the kingdom of God. So now you want to con con convince a Muslim to come to church talking about Jesus when they compare Jesus to Muhammad. You're supposed to talk about the kingdom of God. You know, when you come to the kingdom of God, there is so much love. Do you know every time Jesus preached, he says the kingdom of God is like a king who had a banquet. And he invited everybody to come. He says, you are talking about Jesus who is the door. It's, it's, it's like having a shop that sells merchandise. And you are marketing it. And you start to say, when you come, the door that you're going to meet has an aluminium handle. It is so strong that you need two hands to push it. It's made of gold around it. You're talking about that door. Nobody's going to buy your merchandise. But let's talk about what's in the store. But they'll never buy what's in the store unless they go through the door. Why did I go there? You are the merchandise in the kingdom of God. What will make somebody come to church is your right attitude. Before they listen to Jesus you are talking about, they want to see, do you represent the kingdom of God? Who I love coming to your church based on you. I'm looking at you. Who I love your church. Because I have to look at you who goes to that church and you're staying in my neighborhood. Do I like you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Am I helping somebody in this place? Let's represent the kingdom better. Let's take away the religious spirit that judges people based on their past and disqualify them for what God wants to do in their life. Do you know the whole of Jesus' ministry? He never walked with the church people. He always was found among funny stuff, funny places. He says, I didn't come for those that are well. I came for those that are sick. You see, they questioned him because of where he stayed. Because they have to love the kingdom when they fall in love with you. But there's nothing to fall in love with you. So how do you expect them to come to church? And this is very, very, very sad me. Some people that don't come to church have a better attitude than people who come to church. It's very sad. It's very sad that you find me, most of my friends are not as spiritual as me because church people are hypocrites. They are judgmental. Hallelujah. Can I even go deeper? Just because you are in a garage does not make you a car. Amen. Hallelujah. May God help you. Have the right attitude. So you think when you say I'm a Christian, it's enough. I walk around boasting I'm a Christian. It's beyond that. She always complains everything that is in my garage. There's a lot of things, but they are not cars. Most of the stuff is rubbish, but it's still in the garage. Amen. So make sure you represent the kingdom of God. Amen. Everyone in your neighborhood should be saying, I want to go to your church. Not because they like Apostle Joshua, no. Because they like you as an individual. 
You say, ah, there's something in your church. I need to go to that church. And people will come to the kingdom of God because they like the merchandise of the kingdom of God. And when they come to the kingdom of God, then we preach them Jesus. Let's start with the way we live. Our attitude must be inviting to the world. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Lift up your hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this group of people, these believers that are in the house. Father, we come from different backgrounds, different society that has shaped the way we think. Anything that is not of you, God, may you remove the stronghold. Father, we are open to learn new ideas. We are open to grow, to becoming who you want us to be. Father, we will not be stuck in religion and be limited by tradition and rendering the word of God of no effect because we are stuck with traditions. Father, you said, how can you enter into a strong man and plunder his goods unless you bind the strong man? In the name of Jesus, I bind every stronghold in this place. In the name of Jesus, we uproot anything that is not of your God in their life. Anything that has caused them to be stuck where they are. We are rooted in the name of Jesus. From today, make them believe who you want them to be. They are not failures, God. They are successful. They are prosperous. They are above and not beneath. They are the head and not the tail. They are blessed in their coming in and they are blessed in their going out. Father, may you bless them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You can give us a song. The blood of Jesus shall never you. Oh, <laughs> 
shall never lose. Shall never, shall never, shall never, shall never. Shall never lose this power. Shall never, shall never. Shall never lose this power. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, shall never, the blood of Jesus, the blood of my master, the blood of my redeemer, shall never. Shall never Shall never Shall never Shall never Shall never Shall never, shall never, shall never. Lift up the bread. Say thank you, Father, for the gift of your son. By the stripes that fell on his back, my body is healed. From the crown of my head to the very soles of my feet. Every cell, every organ, every function of my body is healed, restored, and renewed in Jesus' name. I believe and I receive. Now lift up the cup. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. Your sin free, disease free, poverty free, life is in your blood. And your shed blood has removed every sin from my life. Through your blood, I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future, and made completely righteous. Today, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is the preservation, healing, wholeness, and provision. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Amen. One of the things that we fight as a religious spirit is taking Holy Communion only on Easter. And yet the command of Jesus was, every time you are gathered, do this in remembrance of me. So we, we are fighting a stronghold of a system that has been laid for generations on the way that it should be done. And yet God clearly says, every time you meet, that means when you meet in the house, you're supposed to do Holy Communion. The Bible says when they met in houses, they broke bread. So it's another system of religion that we have to keep on fighting. Because religion will make you claim ex exclusivity and say this is the way things should be. But have you ever asked what the Holy Spirit says? I want you to go before the Lord and say, Lord, as I partook of your body and your blood, I don't want the spirit of religion to make me conform to the practice rather than the meaning of it. Because when you do it oftenly, people can see it as a practice and lose the meaning of why you're doing it. 
As I partook of your body, Lord, I will never be sick because you cannot be sick in your body. I will never be poor because you cannot be poor. I took your blood to replace my family's blood. And nothing that affects my family will affect me. Begin to pray. For the next one minute, I want you to begin to pray wherever you are. When I remember what the Lord has done, I will never go back anymore. When I remember what the Lord has done, I will No, 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 I will never go back anymore. No, 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 no. When I remember with you talk to God and you talk to you listen to God and you listen to you love God because he first loved you now unto him who is able to do anything but fail may he bless you may he open doors for you this week may your families be protected may you never lose a loved one in your family in the name of Jesus I pray amen God loves you amen no, 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 no,